What's up, Resonate? How are you? Now, I want to welcome all the campuses. Man, last week I had the special privilege, and I don't get to do this often, uh, but when I do, I love it, is to go visit our campuses. I went to Hayward and met some folks there, met some new folks. I, I got to go to Oakland campus and just met some new folks there too. Uh, one of the uh, new members of Oakland looked down, up and down, and they were like checking me out for a weird reason. I know exactly what's happening, you know, because like we know you, but I don't know them. And so they, we're, we're just kind of checking each other out. And I, I said, I, I know, right? You're, you're saying probably because I've heard it a hundred times, you, you, I'm smaller than you think. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm like, you know, a, a camera adds 10 pounds and we have six of them on me right now. <laughs> and so now that explains it, but it was so good to meet you. And if you are part of our Oakland campus, Hayward campus, meeting at the Vallejo campus or online, and you are new, you are welcome here, you are loved here, because that's how Jesus feels. And we are people of Jesus. And so we're grateful for you and so glad that you're joining us today for a new series that, that we're going to talk about politics. Now you're like, oh, okay. Some of you are really excited, all right, that you know, we're talking about politics, and some of you are a little weary, and I get it. Um, you know, I get it because, and the reason why we're talking about it is because in 2020, the Lord has set a stage for Christians to shine. But for some reason, we dimmed our lights, and we've lost the witness. In the moment where we could have actually told the world and lived the world and showed our saltiness of the world, and to show our light to the world. Instead, we decided to join the world. And, and, and when we saw our nation divided, um, where families are breaking up, where longtime friendships were breaking up, the Christians were doing the same. And the Christians were even leaving their covenant member churches to find a church that was affiliated with their political party. And my heart just grieved as I was experiencing that, not just in our church, but seeing all the other churches. And so we know that we're going to be in a few months into the throes of another political season. And my heart is just to want to disciple you and to pastor you and to shepherd you and guide you through this season. And when the culture breaks down, I pray and hope that the gospel people will rise up. That's my hope. Yes. <laughs> I love that. I love that you love that. And so we're going to go into this great season where I think the gospel people will shine, where people are also citizens in this country, but also sojourners because there's another country that we are a citizen of. Amen. And that is the heavenly, I mean, heavenly citizenship and that our vote matters. And yes, I hope you vote, but our witness actually matters more. And so this is where, why we're approaching this. I want to disciple you. I'm going to shepherd you through this political season. Now, some of you might be saying, man, I came to church to get away from all this drama. You know? <laughs> and so I understand because a lot of us still carry that trauma in our hearts and from our past season. Yet to avoid this topic would avoid the really fall into the pitfalls of what I call political passivity. You know what that is? You see, God has called us to apply the gospel in all areas, that he wants all of glory in every single area of all of our lives. And for us to just deny this area or to move away from this area would say that we're actually losing the saltiness that this world needs. And so Abraham Kuyper, the great missiologist, says this, there's not a one square inch in this whole world which the sovereign Christ does not cry out, mine. Jesus says, this is mine, every area, every square inch of this world. And so Christians are to penetrate the dark areas of this world and become his light. And yet there's some of us who are thinking, man, I love this. Finally, I want to see where this church lines up with my political party. And if that's you, you might not be falling into political passivity, but you might be falling into political idolatry. And that you might be needing to study more of Habakkuk and Matthew rather than Hannity and Maddow. You know what I mean? And so this is, this is what I want to encourage you of. Listen, throughout the series, I know maybe you're hoping at the end of the series, Pastor, will you tell us who you're going to vote for? And the answer is... No, I'm not going to tell you. Um, I'll tell a few of you. Just kidding. I'm not going to tell any of you. Okay, but here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to tell you who you should vote for. I'm not going to give political commentary. 
I'm not going to tell you which party God favors. I'm not going to do that. Because as your pastor, I feel most called to not give you political commentary, but biblical commentary. And as your pastor, I feel the dual role, the duly important role to actually shepherd your heart, to preach the gospel into every square inch of your life. That's my goal. That's my heart. And so I hope that you'll be shepherded, and I hope you will know that we're going to be okay. We really are, because we are gospel people. Amen? Amen. Amen. I hope you believe that. I hope you believe that. In fact, we're such citizens of this new kingdom. The Hebrew name of God, Jehovah Nisi, which we sang in all of our campuses today, it means the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my flag. Which means that when we declare Jehovah Nisi to our God, we're saying we walk under the bannership of God himself. That our predominant citizenship is found in him and him alone. And let me tell you and let me warn you right now. In November, we will be waving a flag, and I pray that you will not be waving a Republican flag or even a a Democratic flag or the flag of our nation, but I pray that you and I will be pledging our allegiance to the flag of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I pray, and I pray that we would be acutely in knowledge of the conviction that you and I have been purchased by the blood of the lamb, not blood of an elephant, not blood of a donkey, not even blood of an eagle but we've been purchased by God himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And that our salvation comes not in the wings of an Air Force One, but he has landed 2,000 years ago in a tiny manger. And he's come to save us and to redeem us and redeem his people. And that he is our one true king. And this one true king doesn't sit at the Oval Office, but he sits at the right hand in the throne of God himself, where he rules and reigns right now. And so, therefore, I hope you don't find any hope in in all the things that you'll see in the next few months in our country. If your hope is found in any other king than Jesus, he or she will surely let you down. But if your hope and my hope is found in Christ alone, then he will never let us down. He will never let us down. And so for the next four weeks, I want to give you a biblical framework of what it looks like to walk through this tumultuous season as gospel people. And we're going to be all right. And I've been praying and studying these things. The Lord has led me a passage, led me to a passage in James. And the reason why is because James, the book of James was written in a very contentious time where the values of Christianity were not being honored and the secular values were being lived out very lively. And and Christians were to live differently in the world and they just needed some wisdom. And so we're going to apply this forcible, powerful agency called wisdom that James talks about. And so I want to invite you to turn there. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do. Would you turn to James chapter 3? James chapter 3 in all of our campuses. And we're going to read from verses 13 to 18. And if you are able, wherever you are, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? And once again, I'll pray that the Holy Spirit preach a better sermon than the one that you're about to hear from me today. James chapter 3, verse 13 through 18, this is the word of the Lord. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, There will be disorder in every vile practice, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That is the word of the Lord for this great Sunday morning and all God's people said, Amen. amen. Please, please have a seat. So let's unpack this godly wisdom, what it looks like in this politically charged culture like ours. Here James paints a stark contrast between two kinds of wisdom. One is earthly wisdom, and one is a biblical wisdom, godly wisdom. And I hope today that you would, in in light of what scripture would teach, see that the godly wisdom is far more beautiful, far more greater, far more beatific than you could ever imagine. He starts by saying in verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? 
He's calling upon us, saying, anybody wise in this room, if you are, let us know by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. There are two things that I just want to pick up from this verse that we see when James talks about this wisdom. It says, first, wisdom is evident. It is empirical. It's not like knowledge where knowledge could be hidden in here and nobody could know, but wisdom is empirical in the sense that you could taste it, you could sense it, you could see it. It's evidenced by good works. And the question is, is that your wisdom? Is that my wisdom? Do people see us as that? You know, the difference between knowledge and wisdom might be like this. Knowledge might be the ingredients that you pick up from the grocery store, and wisdom is actually the meal where you could eat, you could taste. That is glorious that you wrap around the table and look and stare. That's wisdom. But the second thing that we see here, it says that wisdom is meek, that it is subtle, it is mild, and that if you and I don't seek it, purposefully, then we most likely miss it. Do you know that we have five tastes in our taste buds, you know? Sour, sweet, salty, bitter, right? And those are all very strong tastes, right? It punches you in the mouth. That's why we love it, right? But there's a fifth taste. You know what it is? It's umami. Umami. You know what umami is? Umami is this flavor that comes out of like mushrooms and truffles and It's woodsy, it is deep, it's savory, and it's a lot more subtle. The sour, sweet taste play right in the front of your tongue. Umami plays in the back where it really plays well with your olfactory, your nasal canal. Why do I know all this stuff? Because I care about it, okay? (laughs) I love food, and I love my umami. And, And the Bible will say that umami is like wisdom. It's deeper. It's much more subtle. It's phenomenal. And you have to search for it. And this is why when you read Proverbs 4, Proverbs chapters 1 through 8, it describes wisdom and it personifies wisdom. It personifies it as lady wisdom. And look at what it says in verse, in chapter 8, verse 34. It says, blessed is the one who listens to me, watches daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But... He who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. See? So we must seek out this wisdom. But James goes on here talking about the difference between worldly wisdom now and earthly, I mean, godly wisdom. And so first notice how James characterizes the wisdom of the world. Listen carefully, verse 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Man, it it just seems like this is a commentary to the environment of politics, doesn't it? Like vile practice, selfish ambition, disorder of relationships. This is political rhetoric. In fact, I've known long enough that when presidents or incumbents actually uh, debated one another, they did it with class and some dignity. But now it seems like every debate that you see, every news channel that you dial into, there's just this vile, toxic, hate-filled rhetoric that is full of selfish ambition. In fact, this is how news is sold, right? Because it plays into our fear. And it plays into our hate because kindness does not sell. (laughs) Kindness doesn't get your clicks. Hate does. Fear does. Oh, boy, if that person becomes the president, then this is going to happen. God forbid. And we use God's name in vain to try to vote somebody in. And this is how I know that we have idolized politics in way in places where we shouldn't. Because godly wisdom is not defined this way. Earthly wisdom does, this vileness. And yet when you pass by that lawn sign next to your neighbor, you're not thinking about whether that household is saved. You're like, how dare they support Trump? How dare they support Kamala? And we have all these weird feelings about this vile nature that comes out in us. Like, where does that come from? 
And it is normalized in our culture. But, but James says, that's, that's earthly wisdom. Let me give you some godly wisdom here. What does that look like? Verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason. Wait, what is that? Sure isn't in our politics. Full of mercy, good fruits, impartial and sincere. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And gospel people, this is what we're called to, to sow peace. Think about those words. Do you see those fruits be demonstrated in our political arena by our party that we support, the party that we give money to? Do you see those characters ooze out when your friend posts a political thing on Facebook? (laughs) You see all the comments are like, praise God, let's be reasonable, (laughs) let's listen to the other side. Does that ever happen? In fact, it's curious to me, there's not a single person in the history of the world that has ever convinced somebody through Facebook that they should move to the other party. Never, not once. And yet we continue to do it over and over and over and over again. Yet God calls us in this season to have fruit that is hanging on us that's from biblical wisdom, that bring, brings peace, reaps harvest of righteousness. That is our witness. And just in case you think here, but pastor, you know, if we don't fight and make our points, the other person, the other party will get the last word and thou will be seen as weak and passive. And might I just remind you today, the wisdom that James prescribes here is anything but weak and passive. It's powerful. Do you remember what Jehovah Nisi means? It's his flag. And it's just not identification of the kingdom that we belong in and the king that reigns. It is the king that is victorious. And it is the kingdom that ultimately wins. Amen? And so this is it. Yeah, absolutely. This is the kingdom that we're a part of. So it is not weak. And so for the next four weeks, I want to dive into this topic. So next week, we're going to talk about what does it look like for a Christian to engage in politics? What's a biblical way to do that? Then next week, we're going to talk about the unity in the body of Christ. And let me just give you a hint. Unity does not mean uniformity. Okay, it does not mean that. One of the most favorite things that I love to celebrate in all of our campuses is that I, this is the most diverse church I've ever been a part of. It's beautiful. Our diversity is beautiful. We're absolutely unified in the, in the cause of Christ. Amen? Amen? And because of that, yes, we could celebrate that. <laughs> Man. Thank you for celebrating diversity. Because I think that's God's heart. That we're diverse in gifts and kind and function, but we're part of one body. And, 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 so, and so we're going to talk about that in the third week. In the fourth week, we're going to talk about some myths that, um, that we tend to believe about politics, the hope that we put place in politics that's going to fail us, and we're going to talk about that. And after that, we're going to pray for our country. We're going to pray together for our country. Um, it's strange. Like, there are people who say, you love your country. You have never prayed for your country. You've never seen the Bible actually call you to pray for our leaders. And we're going to do that together, no matter who's the candidate. And, and, and then we're going to actually provide you some resources and the digital resources to answer the questions, some of the questions that might have not been answered in the times of preaching so that it will guide you through this upcoming season. But today, what I want to do is I want to actually lean into this wisdom and show you four professions of a wise person during this political season, four things that we declare. If you're a wise person, number one, if you're taking notes, I am to live in allegiance to King Jesus alone. I'm to live in allegiance to King Jesus. And we see this from verse 17. Uh, The Bible says, the wisdom from above is first pure. It separates it. It's first pure. Before it goes off the list of all these ways that is wise, it says it's first pure. Now, the word pure here in the Greek is agnos, which means it is holy, which means it is set apart, set apart for God's purposes. So in essence, what James is saying here is that our ultimate allegiance is our hearts and our values and our minds must line up to be holy. 
It has to be pure. It has to adopt and find its pledge and allegiance to the values of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus then means that you love Jesus above anything. Every other allegiance that you have takes a back seat to our allegiance to him, including your family, period. In fact, the Bible calls us that the, the God of Jehovah Nisi shall not be one, the top of our list of many lists. In fact, he is the whole notebook. He is everything. He's not, he doesn't compete with the other stuff that's on our page. He's the entire page. He's the banner. He's the whole notepad. In fact, consider Jesus' first words here when he launches off into his public ministry in Matthew 4, 17. He says, from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see, Jesus begins his ministry announcing a kingdom that he actually ushers in. Now realize that Jesus is using quite a politically charged language because he's bringing a brand new kingdom into an existing kingdom. Now, who was reigning at that time? Well, Caesar was. And so Caesar would have seen it as a threat to him if Jesus is ushering a kingdom. And most people, when Jesus said this, I'm ushering a kingdom, they thought that he was gonna do it militarily and politically. Why? Because every other kingdom did it that way. But Jesus says, no, I'm not building a military. I'm not building my political clout. I'm not doing that. I'm building a different kind of kingdom, a kingdom that's redemptive, kingdom that is transformational, a kingdom that will win and will be victorious. So when Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what does repent mean? It means you and I are to completely change the orientation of our heart and life. Jesus is calling us right now even to turn our hearts towards him, to a different kingdom, to a different king, which demands our total allegiance to him. That's number one. Here's the second thing that we declare as wise people in the tumultuous season. I am to live as the king's disciple. And I want to show you what this means because the very next verse We see Jesus walking by a sea of Galilee after he ushers this kingdom in. And what does he do? He calls Peter, Andrew, James, and John. He tells them, hey, leave everything of this world and of this kingdom and be a part of my kingdom. And so what Jesus is doing is he's intentionally creating a brand new community, a group of people that would surrender their life to Jesus, to this king and the new kingdom. And isn't it interesting that Jesus... This is what he tells his primary, this is what Jesus is doing to change the world, okay? He is actually building, not legislation, but he's building a community of people to live according to his mission and values under the lordship of his king. So notice here, Jesus doesn't come uh, to be elected into the political office. Look at where Jesus doesn't try to bring reform through legislation, try to get votes or anything. He didn't do that. Now, this doesn't mean that politics is obsolete. We'll, we'll talk about it next week of how important and significant and somehow the Bible even calls us to honor the emperors, okay? But, but what this does mean is, listen, I don't want you to miss this. The primary vehicle to build his kingdom to transform a society, ready, is not through government. It's but through his church. It's through his church not the government. His plan for global reform is through a community of disciples who are fully engaged with his kingdom under this king. And this is the first thing Jesus does after announcing that the kingdom is here. He establishes kingdom community. But here's the third thing that we declare. I am to live out the king's values. I am to live out the king's value in this season to live biblically wise. Look at what he does. He immediately begins to describe what it looks like to live in this kingdom. Now, have you ever read our country's constitution? It's pretty great, to be honest. It's pretty great. But here, Jesus actually shares his constitution, so to speak. Okay? His founding document. 
And what he does right after he gathers his disciples is he gives what he calls not the Constitution, but what he calls the Sermon of the Mount. Okay, and for the next three chapters in Matthew from five to seven, he clearly lays out values and behaviors that the community should rally around under the allegiance of this king in his kingdom. And in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus says things like, blessed are the merciful. He says, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are the peacemakers. Be known for your good deeds. Love your enemies. Be generous. Pray, for you. Pray to your heavenly father. Avoid anger and judgment. Don't judge people. Oh, by the way, we love taking that text, I mean, that out of context. Don't judge. Don't judge others. That's what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't ever say that. Don't judge others. Because if you say don't judge others, you, you just judged others. <laughs> right? So what does it mean? Well, if you read it in context, you would know that Jesus is encouraging us, before we judge others, judge ourselves first. It says, take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of somebody else's eye. Meaning, before you judge, please apply some humility that is fellow sinful beings that we, we too are judged. Right. And, and, and we too are, you know, fallen. And so, so be careful how you judge. That's what it means. So in these three chapters, Jesus clearly lays out how exactly his people should walk, okay? So his people are living in a new kingdom, okay? And, and he's calling them to be a new family, a new community, not through government, but through this community, he's going to rule the world and be victorious, and he's giving us these new values. So let's apply these to politics now. Okay, if, if we are people of his kingdom, we pledge our allegiance to the king of this kingdom, not a political party, not even to a candidate, not even to our nation, even though, man, I love our nation. I love our country. So grateful the, the blessings that we have in this country. Like I go and preach in other countries and visit other missionaries, and I just recently went to Vietnam and realized that and they're not quite free to preach the gospel. They live in a communist system and rule and reign, and how blessed we are to, to know that nobody's going to barge through these doors right now, and we can freely proclaim Christ. But the foundation question is this. Who is your ultimate allegiance to? Which flag do you actually pledge your allegiance to? Is it our nation's flag? Is it a, a Democratic flag, a Republican flag, or the flag of Jehovah Nisi? Um, I was driving once and I saw this big obnoxious truck. <laughs> and you know, with sometimes these big obnoxious, obnoxious trucks, you know, come with this, the flag that they fly in the back. You've seen those? One time I saw it and it just said, American Christian, you know? Um, and it, it just kind of bothered me. And, and this is not semantics. I'm not picking on things. In fact, in that order, you realize the adjective actually modifies the noun which means the primary identity is he's saying, well, is, it, is he more American? Is he more Christian? He's saying American Christian. He's saying my primary identity is American, which modifies the Christian. Okay, so it's like saying I'm a white Christian or I'm a black Christian. I'm an Asian Christian. I'm a Latino Christian. My primary identity is my race. Then I happen to be Christian. Okay, but you see your race didn't purchase your salvation. You know who did? The blood of the lamb. So our identity comes from somebody who says, oh, you've been purchased. <laughs> you've been purchased with the price, and the price was me. And therefore, now we are people of the Lamb. We are the people of God. We're the people of Jehovah Nisi. And that's why we are Christians who happen to be white, Christians who happen to be black, Christians who happens to be male, Christian happens to be female, whatever it is, all the other distinctions come under the primary identity of being a Christian. You see, Christian modifies everything in our life. It modifies everything. It is everything. And everything else is second fiddle. And this is why Paul reminds us Philippians 3.20. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven. You know what the word citizenship is in the Greek? Politeuma is where we get that word. We use that word politics, citizenship. And I would challenge us Christians, what is our politic? Where is our citizenship? 
Is it to a political party? Is it the values of this earth? Christians pledge allegiance to Jesus, his mission, to his community, to his church. Jesus will not play second fiddle to anyone and to pursue that is, uh, wisdom that is pure. We are to find allegiance to the king, to the kingdom, where he is building up his people, sharing his constitution, his values. Here's the fourth thing that we pledge, that we cry out, we declare and profess, I am to repent for bowing down to lesser kings. Um, now, you might hear this and say, of course my allegiance is to Jesus. But here's the reality. Um, you and I have blind spots. And somehow, uh, politics, if we review the tape in 2020, I, I've seen my blind spot and our blind spots grow bigger than ever before. And, and you know, when you read Mere Christianity, uh, C.S. Lewis has this chapter in book three, chapter eight. He has this whole chapter in the greatest sin. And you know what that was? Pride. And let me just quote what he says here. The vice of which no man in the world is free, okay? which everyone in the world loathes in others, which Christians hardly ever imagine that they are guilty of, is pride. Now, could I just remind us right now, if you think you're not prideful, C.S. Lewis is talking to you. <laughs> He's talking to you. So you might be prideful. You see, and the most devoted disciples can have blind spots, especially in the realm of politics. And can I give you a biblical example of this? One of the most vivid biblical examples of this is when the Jewish chief priest, okay, urged Pilate to crucify Jesus. You thought that the Romans killed Jesus. No, Romans just followed orders. You know who killed Jesus? The Jewish high priest. They were like the senior pastors of the Old Testament. They were the rabbis. They were, they were the godly people. But they were threatened by Jesus. They wanted to crucify Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was a threat to their political power. Listen, Jesus wasn't crucified because he loved his enemies. Jesus wasn't crucified because he healed people. Jesus was crucified because he claimed to be king. And his kingship was a threat to them. And so the chief priests realized that the only way that they could legally get Jesus crucified is through Pilate, right? Right? And so they use political means to try to actually get to their particular end. And so they're convincing Pilate to kill him. And so Pilate reviews and, and you know, investigates and sees all the rules and laws and struggles to see that Jesus is actually guilty of a capital offense. So he tells the high priest, I'm like, yo, I don't see anything, a reason that we have to kill this dude, Jesus. And guess what happens to the high priest? They get really indignant and angry. And look at what it says in John 19, 15. And they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to him, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar? That's incredible because the rabbis always taught that God was their king, that it was a part of their daily prayers that recognized God as Jehovah and king, Jehovah Nisi, that the kingdom was coming, that he was king. Over and over again, they would teach people, they would pray with people, they would live under this king, and now under this political pressure, they say, we have no king but Caesar. He's the only king. This is quite incredible to me. Now think about this. The last eight years, I've seen so many Christians who may have not said those exact same words, but they acted as if that was true. I have no king. My only king is our president, my political party. And you know, to be honest and to be gracious and to be merciful and even fair, I, I don't think it was our intention to do that. I, didn't think, I, I don't think it was our intention to sell out our King Jesus or, you know, leave the church to bind to another politically affiliated church where we have no diversity. We have monoethics. We continue to pursue our ideology and we ran away from diversity of thought and mind and spirit and gift. 
we decided to go the other way. And we've easily been caught up in this intensity the moment we lost sight of just living as disciples under a king in a kingdom where he's building a community, a body of Christ, where he's giving us values that are quite different than the ones that you see from Fox News, MSNBC, and CNN. It's different. But Ryan, if we stay silent, you know, they'll win and evil will prevail. And you know, I heard a pastor say the same thing and he actually used Nazi Germany to urge Christians not to be silent, take a stand. If we don't take a stand, evil is going to prevail, is what he said. And listen, I, I'm not suggesting that we're to be passive again. Wait till next week, come back, and we're going to hear how we are to be activated in, in the political system that we have to a certain extent. We're not supposed to stay out of politics as whole. We're to pray for a country and honor the emperor. We'll learn that. But my plea is this, that we would live as kingdom people, applying biblical wisdom, that drips humility, righteousness, and impartiality. Because what I've never heard from this same pastor who promoted this kind of earthly nationalism is the fact that in the 1930s, most of the church in Germany actually supported Nazism. Did you know that? You could look at history. You could Google it right after worship service. All right? <laughs> but you see... When the church got into the front lines of political wars, could we just acknowledge that we've made some boo-boos? We've made some heinous errors. In fact, even in our beloved country, could we acknowledge and repent of things that we've made mistakes under the banner of our love for our country and God, like colonialism, slavery, racism, all these things came with the banner in the name of Jesus. We did it. And it's not just our country, but it's the world that has done that. And so I just want to shepherd us as I try to shepherd my own heart, because as I was studying and praying a lot and asking the Lord to be our Jehovah Nisi, I realized too, there are many times where I gotten it wrong when it comes to the votes and my view of war and all these different issues that we're hearing today, I've gotten it wrong. And so, yes, I do my best, but I curb what I consider best with the understanding that my vote is important, but my witness is more important. My citizenship to this country is very important, but far more important is my citizenship to the kingdom. And so might I encourage you now to examine your heart because in all of our campuses and online, we're gonna actually take communion. And Paul encourages us to examine our hearts. We should do this all the time. I love doing this at our church every single week. Why? Because it's training you and me to examine our hearts every single Sunday to do something that we're gonna do Monday through Friday and Saturday, that you and I should repent all the time where God will forgive us and love us and accept us and give us the restoration and assurance through our repentance. And so we're gonna rehearse that. And so let me give you five categories where you might um, repent of if you're anything like me. Number one, our patriotism. I love being an American. I, I love our personal freedoms that we have. But I've often put the values of this country over the value of Christ and his kingdom. You see, patriotism is not a bad thing unless you love your country more than you love God in this kingdom. And is your highest hope then and your identity found in the eagle, an elephant, or a donkey? Or is your hope found in the lamb? Because it's the lamb that could only save and redeem. But here's the second thing. You're, maybe you need to repent of your priorities. Um, how much more are you drawn to read or watch news, you know, um, than the word of God? How, how does that compare? Like, do you care more about who's in the office or the policies that are being set rather than who actually is being saved? Yes, your vote matters, but your witness matters more. And some of us care so much more about how our neighbor votes 
than where they're going to spend eternity. Are you guilty of that? Like, I certainly am. Like, do you care about where they spend eternity? Then our priorities might be off. Third, our passions, which relates to our emotions. Do you find yourself angry and worked up about politics? You know? When you, when you have all these, like, exasperated emotions, it's called, like, smoke. And when you follow the smoke, you'll always find an idol burning, one of your idols, something that you're far more devoted to than you should. Okay? And so when you are angry at other people, some of us have family members that we could never eat with anymore. They've been uninvited or you've been un uninvited to a Thanksgiving meal. Why? Because of politics. And that's the craziest thing to me. Same with friendships, same with church. Do you find yourself getting angry at others, constantly mocking the opposing candidate? Do you find yourself increasingly anxious about the world? Listen, to be a follower of Jesus is to constantly call our passions to bow at the feet of Jesus, not the other way around. Fourth, our partiality or our bias. And I feel like this gets all of us. Do you often acknowledge and grieve the evil that is in your own political party? Do you ever do that? Are you so biblically wise to demonstrate purity and gentleness, open to reason? Do, you, do, you, do people see you as impartial when you talk about politics? Like, that, that guy is such a fair guy. He acknowledges the evil in his own party. And what I tend to see is in defense of our own party because we feel attacked, we only say good things about it, we only say bad things about the other. Both parties are not inerrant. There's inherent evil in both of them. Do you speak of that? If you rarely speak ill and grieve your own party, then you might be part of the kingdom of an elephant or a donkey, not the lamb. And lastly, fifth, our prosperity. Listen, do you find yourself constantly fighting for your rights, your benefits, my right over guns, my right over my body, my tax dollars, my wealth, my cause. Could I just remind us that it was our king who gave us his kingdom, who also said, my rights you could have. My life, my body is broken for you. My wealth, my kingdom is all yours. My cause is for you. And in the world that is scavenging over what is their right, here is our God, Jesus Christ, laying down his. Why? So that you and I could be a part of a greater kingdom. And that the hope of this world is not politics. The hope of the world, the hope of our country is not nationalism. Our, the hope of the, this country is not politics or a party. It is, it is Christians. It's the church that come together and preach all together a different kind of wisdom than the world that is being displayed right now. And it starts with us just owning and saying, Lord, would you just forgive us? Would you just forgive us? So could I just draw all of our campuses. Would you just close your eyes? Could I just invite you to just close your eyes? Just a moment with you and your God. And I, I just want you to imagine Jesus standing in front of you, just looking at your heart. What does he see in terms of your, maybe your priorities, maybe your partiality, maybe your over passions, you know, maybe your own over-desire for prosperity. Could I just invite you to just go to Jesus and repent? And it's such a wonderful thing to know that when we do, that he will receive us. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so before we take communion, would you, 
would you rehearse what we're going to do for the rest of the week and just repent of your sin and Jesus will surely receive you and he will give you once again standing of sons and daughters as a gift of his grace would you take just a moment to search your heart now Jesus is such a powerful thing to have the full assurance to know that when we mess up, we don't have to run from you, but we could run to you with the utter assurance that you will receive us, you will embrace us, that you will remind us that we have not lost our standing in you because you lived a life that we couldn't and you took the burdens and the debt that we should have. What freedom. So a Christian comes repenting, knowing our God has more grace than our sin <laughs> and is sufficient to forgive and to restore us. Father, forgive us if we've misrepresented you. Forgive us for having idols that shine brighter than who you are. And align us once again to the good Father who wants to remind us that you are the one who's ultimately victorious and you are the solution not for our country alone but for the rest of the world and that is the god who has adopted us through the life of jesus christ so we praise your son we praise your holy spirit and we praise you father because you are a good good dad and all god's people said amen let's give him worship today yes hallelujah <laughs>